Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, and I'm Kenneth Whitwer. I'm the Chair of Science and Meetings for ISEV, and I've been hosting this event since March of 2020, when the pandemic began in many of our countries. Um, so this is our first event of 2022, and I have to say that the year, you know, the start of the year, we always look forward to it, we always celebrate it, but this year hasn't maybe started out exactly like many of us had wanted it to. And just when we thought we were turning a corner in one way or another, you know, we've had something that the virus that's thrown us for a loop again. Uh, but in the midst of all of that, it's really a pleasure and to know that we have this very strong EV community, this scientific community that supports each other and that helps each other through the tough times. So thank you all. And so today we are having a collaboration with Evita, which is the Italian society. So one of, one of my favorite places to be is Italy. We have today four researchers from Italy who are going to present some things to us. So I think we have some excellent EV research that's going on in Italy right now. Two of the groups that are doing this are going to be sharing with us today. So we have a presentation that's going to be coming from Giulia D'Arrigo, and she has, has worked with both uh, Giuseppe Legname and Claudia Verderio. I think both of them are on the line today too. Um, and we're also expecting Martina Gabrielli, another of the authors on the paper. Um, so I would like to, to hand it over now to Julia, who will be giving our presentation. Um, this is a paper that appeared in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles last year. And we're all looking forward to hearing about these astrocyte-derived extracellular vesicles. I would just like to ask everybody, be aware that you're on mute right now. If you have questions or comments for Julia and the team, please put them in the chat box, and then we will allow unmuting at the end so that you can interact with the authors to ask your questions and learn more. So Julia, thank you so much for presenting to us today, and I'd like to hand uh, the screen sharing over to you. Thanks. So uh, good morning or good afternoon or good night to everyone, and thanks for this opportunity to present uh, our work today. So uh, research uh, in our lab is focused on the extracellular vesicles released from glial cells and their role in cell-to-cell -cell communication in the brain. All the experiments that uh, I am presenting today were carried out using uh, astrocytes and uh, extracellular vesicles released by astrocytes. Astrocytes are the most abundant cells, uh, glial cells in the brain, and whose function includes uh, uh, support to the blood brain barrier and uh, neuronal, co and neuronal uh, connections. And uh, uh, they also uh, uh, pro uh, provides neurons of, uh, of nutrients and uh, uh, are implicating in the uh, damage repair after uh, following the injury. So uh, we uh, isolate extracellular vesicles from astrocytes upon the uh, uh, simulation with the ATP and the extracellular vesicles that there are collected from the supernatant and the medium, medium large extracellular vesicles are uh, isolated by differential centrifugation from the, the supernatant. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the ATP allow us uh, to uh, enhance the release of extracellular vesicles. Indeed, in both astrocytes and uh, microglia, the immune cells of the brain, uh, ATP can uh, uh, enhance the production of extracellular vesicles, activating the P2X7 receptors. And uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we can isolate an higher amount of extracellular vesicles and uh, can also reduce the uh, contamination by intracellular organelles uh, released by uh, the cells that were uh, damaged. And, uh, and also uh, this allows us to isolate extracellular vesicles in a, a very short time, about uh, 13 minutes. So uh, research uh, in the lab, uh, we in the past years uh, focused on the the effects of extracellular vesicles on, on neurons. And uh, uh, extracellular, uh, extracellular vesicles from, from glial cells may act at the, the presynaptic uh, uh, level in both in vitro and in vivo after injection of extracellular vesicles in the visual cortex. And uh, specific, uh, sorry. 
and uh, uh, specifically extracellular vesicles can uh, stimulate uh, the excitatory transmission by inducing the sphingolipid cascade while uh, impair the inhibitory transmission uh, activating the endocannabinoid receptor 1 on uh, GABAergic neurons uh, via the release of extracellular vesicles associated uh, to endocannabinoids. So, more recently in our lab, we also uh, shown that extracellular vesicles were also able to act at the postsynaptic uh, compartment by the shuttle of uh, microRNA uh, cargoes. Indeed, uh, extracellular vesicles can uh, deliver uh, a specific microRNA, that is microRNA 146A, and uh, when chronically uh, exposed neurons to extracellular vesicles from inflammatory glial cells, uh, they are able to transfer this microRNA, uh, which causes the decrease of specific postsynaptic proteins, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, destabilizing dendritic spines and causing the loss of excitatory uh, synapses. So uh, these results uh, show that uh, extracellular vesicles uh, may also hypothetically uh, cause uh, the uh, cognitive dysfunctions. So, uh, but uh, it is clear that extracellular vesicles have an, a big impact on the neuronal activity and function. But uh, uh, what happened? How extracellular vesicles are able to reach the target on neurons moving to the extracellular space and uh, have extracellular vesicles preferential interaction sites on neurons? This was still unknown. And so to investigate these questions, I took advantage of optical, optical manipulation combined to uh, live microscopy, so to deliver single extracellular vesicles to hippocampal neurons in primary cultures. And so it must be interaction between uh, single extracellular vesicles with the neural surface. So after uh, the isolation of medium large extracellular vesicles from astrocytes, I characterized them uh, by uh, Western blotting analysis for typical uh, extracellular vesicles markers, uh, as well as negative control. And uh, I also measured the dimension of extracellular vesicles, analyzing them by clean electron microscopy and the tunable resistive pulse sensing. And uh, I observed that uh, the percentage of extracellular vesicles that uh, uh, can be visible in uh, bright field microscopy, so that there were uh, that the dimension was higher than 200 nanometer, were about 34 percent in pre electron microscopy and 58 percent uh, in tunable resistive pulse sensing analysis. So. Uh, after the isolation of the medium large extracellular vesicles, uh, I uh, resuspended uh, the pellet of vesicles in a uh, conditioned neuronal medium and uh, added them on a, a cover slip of neurons mounted on a temperature control live imaging chamber. So uh, then I used uh, an infrared laser beam that was collimating to the optical path of the microscope to trap a single extracellular vesicles in the suspension and deliver them in contact with the surface of neurons. I, keep, uh, I kept them in contact for about 30 seconds, then I switched off the laser and I uh, observed the interaction between the vesicles and the neuron surface by collecting bright, bright field images. So I analyzed more than 400 extracellular vesicles using this approach. And I observed that they were able to adhere on both axon, dendrite, and also the cell body. And there is a, a significant difference between the uh, adhesion on uh, neurites and cell body and uh, with an higher percentage of extracellular vesicles that were able to adhere on uh, the neuron cell bodies. And uh, these uh, uh, experiments were also uh, we obtain also the same results, uh, isolated extracellular vesicles from uh, microbial cells and delivering them with uh, optical manipulation, so with the same approach. So quite unexpectedly, after the addition of extracellular vesicles, we observed that a large fraction of vesicles were also able uh, to move on uh, neurites of 
uh, of hippocampal neurons. So, and uh, they were able to explore, as you can see in this movie, actin uh, protrusions and uh, spines on dendrites and philopodia uh, on uh, axons. As you can see in this movie, uh, here I placed a vesicle on uh, a growing axon and uh, the vesicle explore the thin philopodia while moving along this uh, axonal process. So uh, the motion of uh, extracellular vesicles uh, on uh, cell bodies uh, was uh, in uh, less uh, higher compared to uh, the percentage of extracellular vesicles that were able to move uh, on your eyes. And uh, also considering uh, the maximal distance uh, of the vesicles from the starting point, uh, we observed that uh, extracellular vesicles uh, uh, traveled uh, higher distances uh, on, when uh, placed uh, on the neurites compared to cell bodies. And uh, another thing that uh, is important to consider is that the vesicles, uh, uh, the movement of extracellular vesicles placed on cell body was confined, as you can see in this moving, uh, to the, the region of adhesion and these vesicles uh, never exit, uh, uh, never left the soma of uh, the neuron. So, uh, has the, the first question uh, was to understand uh, if uh, the, mo the motion of these vesicles was uh, outside or, uh, or inside uh, the, the processes of neurons. So to discriminate this, uh, we reasoned that uh, if the vesicles was moving outside, we were able to uh, recapture uh, the vesicles with, with the, the laser trap. So what uh, I did uh, was uh, to keep uh, an extracellular vesicle that uh, was moving fast uh, on uh, a process and uh, turning on the laser and uh, that is blocked completely the, the motion of the vesicles, but uh, uh, the motion of uh, intracellular organelles that uh, uh, were passing inside the, the, the that were transported inside uh, the neuronal process, as you can see, is not blocked. So uh, I repeated this experiment many times and uh, these, uh, they were confirmed as, uh, as you can see by this uh, table below. And so this strongly supports uh, that extracellular vesicles were moving outside neurons. So another uh, evidence of supporting uh, uh, the motion of the vesicles on the surface of neurons was given by uh, uh, some examples, uh, several examples where we observed that extracellular vesicles were able to jump from one process to another, as you can see in this movie. And uh, they were also able, as in this, in this second movie, to, to move to one process to another that belonged to a different neuron. So this suggests that extracellular vesicles can exploit neurites as routes to move among connected neurons. So uh, as extracellular vesicles uh, were able uh, to move uh, uh, with a higher, uh, faster and uh, more on uh, processes, we concentrate to the, uh, the, the, the following analysis uh, on uh, these uh, on the extracellular vesicles placed uh, on neurites. As you can see here, I analyzed uh, the, the position of the vesicles uh, per frame using uh, this custom MATLAB code. I was able to reconstruct the trajectory of the vesicle. And here you can see the reconstruction of the, tra of the trajectory of this extracellular vesicle. And uh, uh, analyzing features of extracellular vesicles, uh, we saw that uh, extracellular vesicles mo moved with uh, a typical stop and go motion. And uh, indeed, as you can see uh, in, this, uh, in, in this graph showing the distance traveled by the vesicles per frame, there are uh, zero values, which indicates that uh, the extracellular vesicles at this site, at this point, uh, was not moving. Moreover, uh, the extracellular vesicles showed a back and forth motion. So uh, as consequence of this kind of motion, they repeatedly localize at the same sites while moving 
uh, along uh, the neuronal process. So uh, with this future, so back and forth motion and stop and go motion, extracellular reticles were able to, uh, to move also prevalently in one direction, uh, either under the grade, so away from, away from the, the, the cell body or retrograde toward the cell body. But we have also to consider that uh, uh, there is a, a significant uh, percentage of uh, extracellular vesicles that were able to move uh, in both direction, uh, so um, undergrade and also retrograde, traveling uh, significant uh, distances in both directions. So as you can see, uh, this is shown in this plot uh, showing the maximal positive and negative distances from the contact point. Then we also observed that uh, the percentage of uh, moving extracellular vesicles and the mean velocity of extracellular vesicles uh, was uh, uh, similar on both axon and dendrites in, uh, in mature neurons up to 11 days. But uh, uh, both uh, the percentage of moving extracellular vesicles and the mean velocity um, decrease on dendrites when uh, on neurons older than 12 days in vitro, uh, while it uh, remained high on, uh, on axons. So this suggests that uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, the motion of extracellular vesicles seems to be important, more important on axon in mature brain. So uh, moreover, what happens when extracellular vesicles stop moving? So uh, we observed that uh, astrocyte-derived extracellular vesicles can induce the formation and, uh, of new protrusions at sites or around uh, the sites where mobile extracellular vesicles stop moving. We were not always able to see the formation of these new protrusions in bright field images, but uh, they were, uh, we can easily uh, observe the formation of thin philopodia uh, using confocal microscopy, as you can see here. Uh, we can see the formation of these two thin philopodia in uh, RFP transpected neurons. So this suggests that uh, extracellular vesicles may move, scan the surface of processes in search for uh, a stable for sites where they can make stable interaction and induce the uh, formation of new protrusions. So now the question is, uh, which is the mechanism underlying the extracellular vesicle motion? So we made two different hypotheses. In the first hypothesis, extracellular vesicles can move binding to a surface receptor coupled to a moving cytoskeletal networks. In the second hypothesis, extracellular vesicles would possess an independent motile capability moving so along a gradient of neural receptors. This could be possible if extracellular vesicles contain cytoskeletal elements, as well as an energy source, which allows to uh, rearrange the cytoskeleton inside the extracellular vesicles. So modifying the shaping of the extracellular vesicles and allowing his movement. So to investigate the first hypothesis, I first intoxicated the uh, neurons with the metabolic inhibitor rotenone. And uh, I observed that uh, there is a significant decrease of the percentage of vesicles uh, delivered with optical manipulation on neurons treated with the, the rotenone inhibitor, and where the energy dependent motion of uh, lysosomes uh, that uh, were stained with uh, fluorescent lysotracker was uh, also blocked. Moreover, I also placed extracellular vesicles on mildly fixed uh, uh, neuronal processes with methanol. And here I observed a strong inhibition of the ability of extracellular vesicles to move on neuronal processes. So this suggests that uh, extracellular vesicles, most of them were able to move on metabolically active neurons. So moreover, to explore 
uh, the involvement of the cytoskeleton in the, inside uh, neuronal processes, I uh, use drug, two, dra uh, two drugs targeting the actin cytoskeleton, cytocalazine D and labistatin, and also uh, drug targeting the microtubules, uh, nocodazole. And I observed that only upon uh, the disruption of cytoskeleton, actin cytoskeleton rearrangements, I observed a significant decrease in the motion of extracellular vesicles on neuronal processes. So it was suggesting a major role of the actin cytoskeleton uh, in the rear, in, in internal rearrangements of uh, actin cytoskeleton inside uh, neuronal processes that mediates uh, the possible motion of extracellular vesicles. So, uh, uh, there is also uh, a, a possible link that uh, couple so the, the extracellular vesicles between uh, the extracellular vesicles to the uh, inner cytoskeleton. And uh, this could be a, a possible receptor that is linked uh, with the inside the cytoskeleton. In support to this hypothesis, we observed that, that uh, in some cases, uh, extracellular vesicles uh, were trans transiently transported along the neuronal processes by the transient of intracellular vesicles. As you can see here, the vesicles indicated with the white arrow has, this is an intracellular organelle scanning, and they are dragged the motion of the vesicle during its path along the neuronal process. Then the intracellular organelles went away and the vesicle continued its motion. Here I have also another example. Uh, also here are the vesicles with the white arrow and the black and the gray are two intracellular organelles that uh, are dragging the vesicle, as you can see here, during its path. And here again. So uh, this uh, evidence suggests that uh, large intraneuronal vesicles may drag the cytosolic portion of uh, extracellular vesicle receptor, so generating uh, a simultaneous intra and extracellular vesicle motion. So uh, the extracellular vesicle motion strikingly resemble the motion of adenovirus uh, on uh, infected cells that uh, were moving uh, in search for uh, the, the point uh, of uh, internalization. So, uh, among, uh, uh, extra among in uh, adenovirus, among for the adenovirus particles, the, the proteins, uh, the receptor that uh, was uh, observed to be uh, involved uh, in the motion of them on the surface of infected cells was a GPI anchor protein. And uh, among GPI anchor protein, uh, we observed that uh, uh, prion protein, or PRP, is highly enriched in uh, medium-large extracellular vesicles compared to donor cells, and uh, it is also expressed on neurons. So the first evidence uh, that uh, brings us to think that uh, the prion protein could be involved in the motion of extracellular vesicles come from, uh, comes from uh, the experiments we performed with the uh, synthetic bits coated with the prion protein. So we placed uh, uh, these bits coated with prion protein on wild type neurons uh, expressing PRP. And we observed that uh, they were able to be transported on these processes. But uh, the transport was uh, uh, significantly inhibited when uh, these uh, synthetic bits were delivered on PRP knockout neurons. So uh, uh, this suggests that uh, uh, the, the, PR, uh, the neuronal PRP may act as a receptor for the PRP coupled synthetic bits. Moreover, to investigate the role of the prion protein in extracellular vesicle motion, uh, we uh, isolated extracellular vesicles from PRP knockout astrocytes and delivered them with optical manipulation on uh, the processes of PRP knockout neurons. And uh, we observed that uh, there was a, a significant uh, reduction of the uh, 
portion of extracellular vesicles that were able to move on, the, on these processes. So uh, this suggests that uh, uh, most of the vesicular or neuronal PRP may be involved in the motion of the extracellular, are involved in the motion of the extracellular vesicles. But uh, to discriminate between uh, the vesicular and neuronal PRP, I also performed the exper experiments delivering uh, extracellular vesicles from wild-type astrocytes on uh, PRP knockout uh, neurons and uh, extracellular vesicles from PRP knockout astrocytes to uh, wild-type neurons. Uh, I observed in both cases uh, a decrease on the percentage of moving extracellular vesicles, but uh, only upon the removal of, uh, the, removal of uh, the vesicular PRP, I observed a significant decrease in the percentage of moving extracellular vesicles. So uh, this data suggests that uh, the vesicular PRP uh, is responsible for the motion of extracellular vesicles and that by interacting with the, um, both PRP, as uh, and this is in, a, in agreement with our uh, um, results with uh, uh, PRP synthetic protein beads, uh, and also with, uh, it, it could interact also with another uh, receptor um, on neurons. So uh, to sum up what I have shown the, so far, uh, our data indicate that uh, most extracellular vesicles are passively transported on target uh, cell surface by rearrangements of actin cytoskeleton via uh, PRP or PRP binding protein that act as a, a PRP receptor on the neuron. Uh, but we have also to consider that we have never observed a complete block of the motion of the extracellular vesicles when we fixed or intoxicated neurons. So this is consistent with the hypothesis that a fraction of extracellular vesicles may have an independent capacity to move. So this could be possible if extracellular vesicles contain elements of the cytoskeleton and also an energy source that allow his, uh, its rearrangement. So uh, to investigate the second hypothesis, I uh, analyze extracellular vesicles with prime electron microscopy and uh, identify a subpopulation of extracellular vesicles uh, containing actin filaments. Uh, this subpopulation was made up of mainly of tubular and uh, elongating extracellular vesicles, but uh, we also observed the presence of filament in the, the typical round-shaped extracellular vesicles. Moreover, we also investigate uh, the ATP content of in extracellular vesicles uh, by two different uh, ATP bioassay. In the first, uh, we used the oligodendrocytes as ATP sensor cells. Uh, in, in fact, uh, oligodendrocytes are able to respond to ATP with the uh, uh, with the, uh, calcium transients, and uh, as you can see here. Uh, I added extracellular vesicles to oligodendrocyte loaded with uh, uh, the, the calcium indicator FURA2, and I observed uh, the intracellular calcium uh, transcells after the addition of extracellular vesicles, but this was uh, uh, completely aggregated when we treated extracellular vesicles with uh, the ATP degrading enzyme uh, APRASE. So uh, this uh, demonstrated that uh, extracellular uh, ATP was the compound uh, uh, that uh, was able to mediate the uh, intracellular cal the, uh, calcium transients uh, in oligodendrocytes. So to also uh, help the leakage of the ATP from the uh, lumen of extracellular vesicles, we disrupt the membrane of extracellular vesicles and we observed uh, a clear calcium transient in uh, oligodendrocytes. Uh, so this confirmed that uh, the ATP was inside the lumen of extracellular vesicles. Uh, moreover, to confirm that extracellular vesicles contain and release ATP, we also uh, did a second bioassay uh, exploiting B16 uh, cells that express uh, renilla farfise luciferase, which is able to uh, detect 
uh, extracellular ATP. So after the addition of uh, extracellular vesicles to, to be 16 cells, uh, we uh, observe a significant increase in the uh, activity of the luciferase. So uh, this confirmed that uh, extracellular vesicles were able to uh, uh, release uh, ATP in the, in the proximity of the plasma membrane. We also stain uh, the intracellular uh, ATP in extracellular vesicles using uh, the fluorescent dye quinacrine that uh, is able to stain a storage of ATP. So uh, in, finally, so to investigate uh, if uh, uh, the, the rearrangements of the cytoskeleton could uh, happen inside uh, the extracellular vesicle, I treated extracellular vesicles uh, with uh, cytocalasin D. So in order to uh, disrupt the cytoskeleton rearrangements and uh, by Western blotting analysis, uh, I was able to uh, uh, confirm the presence of actin inside uh, uh, in extracellular vesicles. And uh, uh, I also confirmed that, uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, an, in an increase in the globular versus filamentous actin uh, ratio in, uh, 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 in uh, extracellular vesicles treated with the cytocalasin D. So uh, the drug caused uh, the polymerization of filamentous acting filaments. Uh, so to investigate uh, with the, uh, the involvement of the, cyto the, the, the actin cytoskeleton inside extracellular vesicles in their motion, I uh, delivered uh, cytocalasin D extracellular vesicles uh, on the surface uh, of neurites, uh, and I observed that uh, there is a lower percentage of cytocalasin D treated, treated extracellular vesicles uh, in motion along neurites uh, uh, compared to uh, control extracellular vesicles. So, suggesting that uh, the actin rearrangements inside the extracellular vesicles may modify the shape of the extracellular vesicles. So producing uh, in a fraction that is about 30% of the moving vesicles, in a fraction of these vesicles, a motion uh, along the gradient of neuronal receptors. Uh, our results uh, showed that uh, extracellular vesicles uh, were able to, uh, uh, to move and that uh, they, their motion was not randomly, but uh, it follows new rights as routes to move uh, among uh, connecting neurons. And uh, uh, we have also to consider that uh, this extracellular motion of extracellular vesicles that uh, carry uh, pathogenic uh, molecules uh, such as uh, uh, misfolded proteins tau and amyloid, amyloid beta in neurodegenerative di the diseases may be involved in the progressive spreading of synaptic dysfunction uh, where they first originate such as in the internal cortex uh, to larger brain uh, regions uh, exploiting uh, uh, a defined pattern of connection. So uh, this is uh, a point that Martina is uh, now uh, actually exploring uh, in our lab. And uh, we also think that uh, understanding the extracellular vesicle motion and their interactors uh, on neurons uh, and also imaging the, the extracellular vesicles in vivo can open up to novel treatments uh, to limit the progression of neurodegenerative processes. So I would like to thank uh, all my uh, colleagues uh, and uh, my lab and my team and, uh, and all, all the authors of, of this uh, paper. And obviously, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very, very much, Julia, for that clear presentation and for this very exciting data. Um, and congratulations for publishing this. I have to say it's some, if you'll excuse me, some moving and intoxicating work. So <laughs> I think that probably everybody on the call felt that way too. So we do have a lot of questions that have come in in the chat box. I'd like to start by inviting uh, Professor Askenaz. Phil, would you like to ask um, the questions that you had about ATP and controls. Yeah, I, I, well, this is a very elegant 
system, and I'm sure uh, you covered these, but I, I didn't read the paper. So it is this ATP dependent, um, since you add that to the uh, cells to produce them, and, and how, what is their surface like compared to non-ATP stimulated? Um, and the uh, last part about all this was, uh, what about uh, uh, vesicles from another tissue? Um, and how, do, how big is the subpopulation? And how does it differ from the regular population? So uh, I have to say that we have not carried out a careful characterization of constitutive uh, vesicle produced by astrocytes compared to those produced by um, upon ATP stimulation. But we did this uh, study, this analysis on vesicle produced by microglia. That is all uh, where also the production is ATP dependent. And by a proteomic analysis, we found that stimulation with ATP of microglia increased the number of surface proteins that are involved in cell to cell adhesion and also uh, increased. Um, um, protein related to the autolysosomal pathway and uh, to metabolic pathways. So in a, in a way, uh, these changes can reflect the changes that ATP can induce in donor cells. And I expect that similar changes could occur also in astrocyte. And also uh, we have noticed that uh, vesicle produced upon ATP stimulation adhere more, uh, um, adhere more to uh, astrocyte in this case, because it was microglial vesicles produced upon ATP stimulation uh, adhere more to astrocytes. So for sure, ATP is inducing changes also in the composition and is not only in inducing the production of the vesicle. So we are aware of this. The subpopulation, uh, how many, what percent of the total is it? And how do they differ from the, the non-subpopulation? I'm not sure to, to understand. You say it's, it's a subpopulation that has these properties. Is it 1%, 10%, 50%? That you mean that has this property that move on, on the vesicle or yes. on, on, uh, on, at the surface? It is uh, about uh, um, between 60 and 70% of quite large vesicle that moves. Okay, and we have focus because I, I, in the chat, there are other people asking why we focus on medium large vesicle instead of analyzing all the subtypes. And this is mainly due to a technical problem because using this approach, optical manipulation and bright field yes, analysis, yes, yes. Uh, very small vesicles are below the resolution limit. So we yes, can yes. see only, um, uh, so while using um, la quite large you, you have to be congratulated on, okay. on working on, on on these instead of the usual okay. absolutely <laughs> yeah very okay. very good point phil and um yeah so it, it 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 then remains an open question too what's happening with the very small ones so so really really fascinating um area here and some questions for others to explore too so um, and speaking of exploring, so Susan Goals has a question here about the exploring behavior. And she was one of the, the two who asked about the 30K um, vesicle population. So Susan, do you want to go ahead and ask your, your other question? Yeah, the exploring question. So I think you sort of began to get to this. So I'm trying to understand the specificity, if, if there is a specificity among the cell types. So you mentioned that you looked at microglia and so you've got astrocytes adhering to and exploring neuron neurons and you've got microglia, I think you said, adhering to astrocytes. So I'm trying to figure out is, you know, if you take microglial EVs, do they do the same kind of exploring on neurons and do the astrocyte EVs go on to microglia, you know, sort of what's your specificity? You've got two different kinds of EVs now, and is this behavior specific? I think that's important. So I, I guess I can answer because uh, uh, I'm also, sorry. So 
Um, I work with uh, Claudia and Julia and um, in the last few years I focused on the, um, studying the movement uh, um, at the neural surface of microglial EVs. Um, so um, we can see a similar behavior um, between uh, associatic and uh, microglial EVs. Uh, so we can see that uh, uh, microglial EVs uh, um, also efficiently move at the neuronal surface. Um, we didn't uh, um, perform the, these uh, um, uh, very deep analysis uh, on the movement. Uh, um, however, we can say that uh, there are some similarities like uh, uh, the fact that on the axons, uh, they are moving uh, um, quite, uh, um, um, quite fast, uh, while uh, on the dendrites, they, they um, uh, look like uh, um, they are more prone to, to, to stay still um, and um, so then we think that this is something interesting to um, explore more deeply. Um, and uh, in particular, what uh, um, we are, um, okay, my, my work um, is uh, on uh, also on uh, how um, with this movement, uh, vesicles, uh, microglial vesicles can uh, um, spread uh, um, pathological signals, uh, uh, in particular uh, A beta um, uh, molecules uh, um, between neurons. Uh, or, yes, I mean, by now it's just uh, uh, by moving on axon, so uh, from uh, the uh, cell body to the periphery of the axon. I guess, I guess a different way of putting it are, have you found extracellular vesicles that do not have this exploring behavior on neurons? Do you have a negative control? I mean, are these, is this exploring specific for glial cells, for example, or is there a negative control that where the EVs just sit there or don't bind or whatever? So we, um, as a ne negative control, we tried with beats. Uh, co synthetic beats uh, coated with the uh, uh, BSA, and yeah. uh, they they can move, uh, but uh, uh, less uh, the the percentage of moving uh, uh, particles uh, uh, is lower compared to uh, glial vesicles, uh, and also yeah, so so the distance that can they can run is uh, significantly lower. Um, okay. Yeah. Great, great question, Susan. Thank you, and. One more exploring question here, Raphael Schneider. Uh, yes, thanks. And I asked this question before you uh, showed the data on the on the ATP. Um, uh, so, but but in just uh, from a you know a very fundamental perspective, um, do you think that uh, a lot of these movements may actually be influenced by the cells? I mean, we, we're here with fans of of EVs, of course, and we would like like them to be exploring things and be very active uh, mediators in, in in this in this relationship, but I'm just I'm just wondering uh, what the cell uh, may be contributing uh, to to the movements that you're observing, and have you done any additional studies on on what the cell uh, may be uh, may be doing here? Our experiments uh, say that uh, probably there is uh, the thirty percent of motion that is dependent on the the vesicle, and the other seven about seventy that is dependent on on the the neuron energy, so the transport by uh, the, the metabolic active neuron. So I, no, we didn't uh, further experiment on to understand, so revealing this, but we think that uh, um, there is not, uh, 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 we distinguish between, between these two different uh, uh, motions thanks to the inhibition. But uh, we think that uh, both motion uh, can uh, happen at the same time. So uh, we think that the vesicles could have uh, itself the capacity to move at, and at the same time, also the neuron can uh, uh, pull the extracellular vesicle along the surface. Very good. Uh, our next question, F. Massaggio, is this fun well? Let me just ask, is the movement of the EV on the axon changing the behavior? That means neurotransmitter release, connections, protein expression, etc. So I can try to, to address this question. Uh, what we know is that the contact between the vesicle and neurons is fundamental for any uh, functional effect because if we prevent adhesion, 
uh, we don't do not see modulation of neurotransmitter release. We don't see induction of new protrusion. We do not see changes in the dendritic spine shape that we observe locally at the site of contact. If the motion is important as well, uh, it's really difficult to say at the moment. So uh, probably is important uh, the time also that the vesicles spend in a specific point and, and the contact point where the, the interaction is, uh, is occurring. Great. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to ask the next questions myself, uh, but any of you is welcome to unmute and follow up. Um, so from Mauro Mano, he asks, is the stop and go motion random um, or perhaps there are some frequencies, wavelengths, uh, something that might relate to the substrate? So again, <laughs> uh, what I think is that uh, probably it is not random because we see differences in, uh, in the behavior, in the motion, in developing neuron, in mature neuron, and in fully differentiated neuron. So in developing neuron in culture, maybe we see the same behavior of motion, stop and go, along developing dendrites and axons. But when the neurons uh, get well differentiated, the motion um, uh, is different on dendrites and, and in the axon. So uh, the motion remains high and the speed high along the axon, while in, in the dendrites, uh, it's uh, higher, the, 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 the chance that the vesicles stop moving. Okay, so, so it, it is increased uh, the, the, the top that the vesicles spend, uh, spend um, at the same point. So uh, this can also reflect the maturation and the expression of, of more complex surface molecules and receptor on the surface. This could be a, an interpretation. Um, and so we have uh, discussed here the different EV subtypes. So we'll move on here to uh, Ferena asks about uh, EVs from neurons. Could they possibly transmit signals between neurons? But I think that's, um, that's not something that has been investigated yet. Mm -hmm. um, so let's move then to Janusz, Janusz Rak, he um, had to leave, but he asks about biogenesis of these motile EVs. Can you speculate about that? Do you think that they, the biogenesis, the rate perhaps has something to do with neurodegenerative disease? I guess that really the, the biogenesis is not, is not really what the focus was here, correct? Uh, yes, actually, we have just um, using clear electron microscopy, we, we see a lot of het heterogeneity and we really think that vesicles that have active motion are those yeah. that are bigger and contain actin filaments, but that's, uh, and it could be also that in, in a way, these elongated vesicles may also be um, uh, derived from the fragmentation of nanotubes mm. or uh, these structures that can um, make connection between cells. So. Uh, it could be that these vesicles have also a different origin, but it's just a speculation. So we have no evidence at all to, to demonstrate a different right. origin of these vesicles. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we have, we have a few questions here that I think um, have a common theme. Um, and so we have questions from Benedetta, from Hermann Altmeppen, and, um, and a few others. Let's see here. Uh, Berta Puj. Um, John Bissler. So everybody is asking about the function here, you know, so are these vesicles that are interacting with the surface at some point taken up? Or do you think that a function can occur, as Hermann suggests, without being taken up? So, so can, you, can you speculate on, 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 on what the final fate of these large interacting vesicles might be? I think that there are um, different possibilities. For example, uh, we are uh, actually uh, trying to get more insight into the dynamic of motion along dendrites, because one idea that we would like to explore is that um, um, along dendrites, uh, uh, the motion may be important, for example, to deliver a specific signal to synaptic sites that can be important also for remodeling of dendritic spine. So in other words, we think that they, this vesicle may be involved also in promotion of synaptic pruning by microglia. This would imply that the vesicle deliver a molecule uh, even in, on the surface of the neuron, not necessarily in the cytoplasm. But, uh, in, um, but I think that um, 
the motion of the vesicle along the axon may also have important role for spreading of synaptic dysfunction among synaptically connected neurons. And this is actually comes from uh, the work that has been done recently in the lab by Martina, and which indicates uh, that um, this vesicle by moving along the axon can propagate uh, impairment in, uh, in a form of um, synaptic plasticity uh, that is um, LTP or long term potentiation. And, uh, and this propagation of impairment of synaptic plasticity does not require the, the discharge of the cargo to, to, to the neuron, to the recipient neurons, but again, it can, can be mediated by the interaction of the vesicle with receptors uh, present at the cell surface. So, I can, uh, I mean, about the internalization, um, we actually, um, okay, um, limited to the population of vesicle that you can uh, see in the mic microscopy. So it's uh, the bigger vesicles. Uh, uh, we don't see, uh, usually, we, we usually don't see internalization. We also try to investigate this uh, with uh, some uh, um, dye. Uh, which, I mean, it's tricky working with dyes and vesicles, uh, still we tried and uh, we were quite uh, um, uh, happy uh, by using the m cling dye. And uh, um, we, also in that case, we saw like uh, that the 97% uh, of vesicles uh, delivered added, uh, del yes, deli yes, or delivered also in bulk uh, to, the, to the neurons. Uh, they were not able to be internalized, so we saw them uh, uh, once um, we um, um, fix uh, the, the neurons, we saw the vesicles uh, on, still on the surface uh, of, of axon. processes. Yes, okay. so of that's the... more than 19%. Yeah, yeah. We're, also, we're outside after one hour of addition. Okay. So in, in other words, we think that uh, the signaling to the axon is not mediated by large EVs, by internalization, just because this vesicle cannot be taken up yeah. in the axon. So for Interesting. You know, I think that um, we, we will need to, uh, to close now. We've come to the end of the hour, but I just there's just one more set of questions here that I think are really, really um, intriguing. And they're, they're from Jean-Vierre Bart and uh, Georgia Melli. The ATP, so ATP stimulation, you said that this is mediated by the P2X7 receptor. How is that ATP being exposed to the receptor? Is it that the ATP, uh, you, you know, what, what, what is the topology anyway of the ATP transfer? So do you mean the ATP inside the vesicles? How indeed, yes, out? that's as I understand the question is also what Georgia here is asking. Yes, because in, in the, in the bioassay, in both bioassay that Julia uh, have described, uh, we see a response that implies that the ATP is discharged from the vesicle lumen uh, outside. Mm -hmm. So we, we really do not know how uh, ATP can can cross the membrane, but we think that there are many channels which uh, allow uh, the um, ATP release from cells and probably the same mechanism uh, can be in place on the vesicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So there's there's got to be some kind of transporter there and maybe that's another interesting question to um, to address. So. So we've come to the end of the hour. Thank you all for joining this first EV Club of 2022. We're really happy to partner with Evita on this. And um, thanks, thanks uh, Julia in particular for sharing your work and for all the team members who have been here, Claudia and Martina and uh, Benedetta for sharing too what the Italian society is doing. So just like any good study, I think this one has raised some very fascinating questions that I'm sure many of our participants are going to be thinking about in the coming days. As we, as we depart, I just want to draw your attention to this little uh, slide behind me. So we have, we have a new kind of event for EV Club, and we're calling it the EV Trailers. Um, so this is going to be something where we know that not everybody can present their work on EV Club because there are a limited number of events. But if you have a paper that's come out, a preprint that's come out, um, you can prepare one of these uh, nine or ten or nine slide uh, presentations 
to share that work and we can um, we can do that straight to video. So it's going to go straight to video right onto the YouTube channel after a short review process. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me as well if you have something that you'd like to uh, to advertise on the channel. So thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of the day, great rest of the night, wherever you may be in the world. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye.